couple of Welcome to everyone. We're glad you're here for our meeting. Uh, we're going to start first with the review and approve the agenda. May I have uh, everyone you see what the agenda is and if there is anyone who wants to make a motion one way or the other about accepting the agenda? Yes. I move to approve the agenda. Thank you. I move to approve and a second from second. Ms. Uh, Mrs. Ration. And we will, all of us, uh, will there be a vote on that? All those in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. Looking at the Board of Ed minutes from 12 8 14, which was our workshop with Jonathan Costa, is there a motion that we accept those minutes from people that were there also? Motion to approve. Thank you, Penny. The, uh, second. second from Sangeeta. Thank you. All those in favor, please raise your hands. And that's all right. Abstaining is fine if you're not there. And we still pass with those that are here. Um, comments from the public. To ensure the public's right to be heard, the board has set aside time during the meeting for public comments. Two minutes are allotted to each speaker and a maximum of 15 minutes to each sub a subject. Is there anyone who would like to speak? Seeing that there's no one coming up to speak, I would now like to turn to Dr. Litzy and ask if you would introduce our first topic, please. Sure, it'd be my pleasure. Yeah. Tonight, our first uh, report will be from Bill Silver and Michelle. Bill and Michelle come to us from Silver Petrocelli. They, we, they may look familiar to you. If they do, they are our architects as well on the South Project. Uh, back in the fall, we contracted with Bill and Silver Petrocelli to complete a facility needs assessment. Uh, and in the ensuing months, they went to each of our buildings, interviewed folks, did lots of research, and put together the comprehensive report, which you received last week, uh, mm -hmm. talking about our facility needs and helping us to prioritize some of those needs um, in the short term and in the long term. So Bill and Michelle are here to share with us a high-level overview of those findings of, in the report and to answer any questions and entertain any dialogue about it. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Bill Silver with Silver Petroselli, and with me is Michelle Miller, two architects uh, that really represent the architecture and engineering and interior design of Silver Petroselli. Uh, the five buildings have been prowled by our architects and our mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and fire protection engineers. Um, and you kind of have had a sense, or you've seen little tidbits, at least, of the report some perhaps more than others, and you can see the degree of services that we provided uh, with each one of them in terms of really getting our heads into the school, looking at not only their short-term immediate needs as well as their long-term needs. We're looking sometimes at 20 years down the road with some of your systems. So really giving you hopefully all the pieces, the shopping list, if you want to call it that, from which you can develop either your short-term five-year capital plan or at least know what's 10 years out or what is 20 years out as part of your planning. So hopefully we've given you all the pieces. You have truly a draft in your hands. We're looking for your feedback, your input, as well as all the staff input that know the buildings even more than we do. This is certainly just our first pass at it. Um, and if, if anything more if beyond me, the person that really knows the study more is Michelle. So I'll defer to uh, Michelle Miller. She has been the one truly crawling all the spaces. And she'll give you the quick, hopefully in less than 10 minutes, maybe 12 minutes, a brief overview of what we have. We'll go quickly, let the pictures do the talking. You can stop us at any time, but if you want to wait until we hit all the buildings and then nail us at the end, feel free to do that as well. So Michelle. Thank you. Aside from our written report, we've come up with a spreadsheet here that documents all of the actions we feel that need to be taken with these buildings. And not only do we provide a cost with that? We prioritize that. We have priorities set from one through four, one being um, an urgent priority, two high, three moderate, and then low for the fourth. So I'm going to touch on some of the bigger items that we have for you. And just starting with East School, and this is just a breakdown of the costs, I'm going to start with site improvements. We've broken it into five categories, I'll mention. Site improvements, um, exterior, building envelope, interior, and then mechanical and electrical. Here we have site improvements, um, the usual ceiling, the ceiling cracks. Here at East School, we also have issues with the playgrounds, which we feel are important, and introducing putting a rub solid rubber surface. And then again, working ramps to make these buildings ADA accessible. On the exterior, we um, see the roof replacement coming in the future. We also have um, fascia problems here, which can be incorporated with the roof replacement. 
But at the East School, another issue that we, we see is the, with this exposed structure here. Um, see a, oh, I'm sorry, over here. Um, the exposed structure is resulting in ponding that occurs at these planes, and it's actually starting to infiltrate the building. As I go to the interior, this shot here shows you some of the flooring that's delaminating. So it's coming off probably because the moisture is getting in the floor. And these tiles happen to have asbestos underneath them. So we're putting a cost of $102,000 associated with that work. Inside, we also have some ceiling replacements and some expansion joints that need to be replaced, along with adding sinks and other various items. On the mechanical side, you'll see that the number is quite high. I broke it down to show you that the immediate needs are more around the $250,000. Um, one of the big items here is replacing the underground fuel oil storage tanks. Um, electrical improvements include upgrading some exterior emergency lighting, and then the fire alarm system is on the horizon of needing replacement. Can I ask yes. A, a lot of the buildings have the underground tanks. When you made your costing assumptions, they assume that there's been no leakage, that it's just that number. Up, remove it, test it. Yeah, that number doesn't include any hazmat because we don't know, we won't know the extent of it until you, there's more research done. And more. your staff is monitoring tank levels anyway. They're going to have a sense whether you've been losing fuel or not, and that just not, has not been the indication. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, moving on to South School. We have some similar issues here as they are, um, you know, were done around the same time in 1997. But on the exterior, um, South School has some other issues. Um, there's retaining walls that need some help, so we mark that at around 25,000. Pathways to the classrooms either don't meet the stoop or don't slope down appropriately, so we have a cost associated with that, along with other um, hardscapes and playground replacement there. On the exterior, here we have some more repointing needed at this school. It's a little bit older than your other schools, so it's a little bit higher here. The chimneys in need of significant work, expansion joints on the outside also. On the inside, things we noticed were that the cafeteria could really use um, a Wayne's coating since it's getting damaged by some of the machinery that goes through there. We also have more expansion joints on the inside and then just some other finishes and sinks. To give you a sense, when you see all those expansion joints at all the schools, these expansion joints are doing exactly what they're doing, supposed to do. They're supposed to accommodate the movement, the shifting of the buildings over time, whether it's immediately after construction or 20 or 30 years down the road. Buildings move. We'd like to deny that they don't happen, that these expansion joints are meant to move. And so when you get cracking like you see on that floor tile in the lower left-hand corner, that's customary. We now make expansion joint materials that are a little bit more metallic. They don't break up or crack like the old uh, floor, uh, vinyl floor tiles, but these cracks are where they're supposed to happen. They are not indicative of serious structural problems. They're doing what they're supposed to. It just means you have to spend a little bit of money every 10 or 15 years just to take care of the expansion joints. Mechanical, again, we have the same note about the under, underground fuel oil storage tank, along with domestic hot water equipment and ventilators out on the roof. Electrical, same comments about the exterior lighting. Here, um, there's some work with the panels, and again, the fire alarm system is nearing the end of its life. Moving on to West School, we have similar issues here at the ex, um, in the site. There's an old trellis that we recommend removing. It's really worn down, and there's a cost associated to replace it, around 25000 There's curbs, common sidewalks, and resealing the parking lot. Um, another issue we noted on the exterior that we think is important is this condensate drain spewing right out where the children are waiting for the bus under the canopy. Ice is going to build up there, so we, we consider that to be a high item. There's also repointing at this building that's needed. We're mentioning about the roof replacement. Here we're saying to add a canopy since um, the janitor told us about kids going up there. that It's a low wall. They can get up there, so putting a canopy would help s solve that. In the interior of West, we have an issue with the gym floor. The rubber flooring is puncturing, um, causing a tripping hazard. There's apparently problems with the slab, so we have a high number there to accommodate work to the slab and to getting a new, floor, new rubber flooring. There's ceiling replacement here, and there's a lot of older um, toilet rooms still at West that need to be updated for ADA compliancy and just newer fixtures. 
The mechanical estimates here also include the underground fuel oil storage tank, along with some other roof work associated with the weather hood and the exhaust at the kitchen, and then more similar items such as the hot water, um, the domestic water heating equipment. And again, it's um, exterior lighting here, and the fire alarm system is nearing the end of its life. Moving on to Sachs Middle School, um, we see some different issues here. The exterior, there's a ramp in pretty bad disarray outside of the media center. Um, curbs need to be replaced. And then another thing we noted is that the parking lot seems somewhat inadequate for the population, and we put a number there associated with increasing the count of parking there. Um, at the exterior of the middle school, we have a lot of brickwork um, repointing at around 100,000. And then there's significant um, cracking. And here you can see this is a control joint that's actually moved outside of the media center. So we are recommending to get some structural analysis. This movement isn't anything to be completely alarmed with. It's not unsafe or anything, but we think a second opinion would be good from a structural engineer because we're also seeing some movement on the inside, which I'll get to. Um, there's a little bit more exterior work here. The, this wall was hit right next to the gas tank, so that's important to repair. Uh, lintels are rusting, and window caulk, we know that this um, contains some hazardous materials, so it has a higher number here. On the inside, um, the stair rubber flooring is delaminating. We recommend replacing that, replacing the older toilet rooms. And then here at Sachs, almost all of the expansion joints are either dented, there's more significant movement, um, there's also cracks in some of the concrete block in the media center, and more cracks in the floor sloping. So that, those are more reasons that we think a structural analysis should be done. On the mechanical side, we also have the underground fuel oil, oil storage tank again, and some of the other similar issues going on with that. Um, electrical, we ha need to test um, the main electrical disconnect, provide exterior lighting, and the fire alarm again. The high school, considering that it was done in 2008, there really aren't many issues with, so um, we don't have, we just kind of gave you the overview. It's totaling at under $100,000. There's really not much going on here. Yeah, nothing that's a high priority. There is more in the report on the little bit of items we did find. But. So we kind of zipped through it really quick. Sorry <laughs> if we went too fast, but we figured we'd spare your time if you didn't want to hear all the details and let you pepper us with questions or certainly read through it and send your comments to us as it goes from draft to final at whatever point you choose. Yeah, Penny. So uh, the caulk at Sachs, was, that, was the original caulk left? in the windows uh, when they renovated in 95 and 97, or? I believe so. Okay, so then the original school was built, I forget when, but yeah. Yes, I, I, I can't recall okay. off the top of my head, but I have it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh. Probably 95 wasn't all, it wasn't the replacement caulk that is failing, it's probably the original. It's the original caulk. It's quite mm -hmm. often we always tend to, Caulking doesn't get much attention from any of us on the facility side because it's a low impact, totally exterior type of thing. Well, and you just said that it had, you thought it might, ha it might have hazardous materials in it. So I figured it wasn't from 95 to 97. But. Correct, in that age it would not. Okay. Yep. Deanna? Um, I just, I had a question about the fire alarms. I know it, it's not um, a, a number one item. Um, and you said it, they're ending uh, or they're getting close to their end of the, your useful life. How much more time do you think we have on those? Um, I believe our electrical engineer said probably about five years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Things like emergency lighting that you see as a common theme to all of them. Now that one is something that your fire marshal can mandate at any time because the fire code is retroactive. So should the fire marshal ever go through and inspect and really want to impose any of his code-driven elements, he can impose them, give you a 30-day uh, cure notice, and of course, with most town fire marshals, you have years to correct those notices. But if anything, we mentioned at least those high-priority items, which are current code requirements, which they have the power to enforce retroactively. Building code is not enforceable retroactively. Fire code is. 
Uh, Scott. Uh, I want to learn a little, little bit more about ADA compliance. And, and I'm not in any way suggesting mm -hmm. that we don't want to do everything and do everything quickly and immediately and well. But is our ADA compliances like many other codes where once you start to do any construction, you must do 100% of them? Or are these things feasible or are they? <laughs> Uh, technically, your schools sh should have been built even from 1973 under the 504 U univer uh, Universal Federal Accessibility Standards, UFAS 504. Those were the precursors of ADA. So even from 73 on, there should have been minor elements of accessibility. To answer your question, only as we touch new elements within the school or as you touch new elements with your corrective work, do you have to then provide accessibility. So if you are not renovating the toilets in any of the elementary schools, you are not mandated to make those accessible. Uh, the only time that ADA kicks in is there's no in technical, no enforcement of the ADA laws except by lawsuit. And that's mm -hmm. only if citizens were to care to, to, care to bring a uh, claim against you. But there's nothing within mm -hmm. this study or your studying of the action or even of the capital improvements, like for instance, the South Window Project. There's very little ADA there, except perhaps some of the entrances. And so to answer your question, as we improve the maybe six entrances <laughs> that we're improving around the school, you better believe it. They are going to have the push and pull clearances that are required by ADA. But that's about all that needs to be done at entrances, for instance. But you do not have to go retroactively back into your schools and start uh, making ADA uh, uh, compliance improvements unless you're either under a federal um, uh, uh, report and action which comes from the Office of Civil Rights out of Boston or whether it's a local claim. Did you happen to notice if are there any uh, ADA failures that are <clears throat> that, that, that are part of newer renovations that should have been done and weren't or these are things that date back to yeah, they, they, they pretty much date back, or it's newer ADA codes that weren't around when those were done, so yes. So we did see improvements where we saw more modern uh, restoration work, uh, like Saks has many elements that are accessible, even the elementaries where you've done, um, I don't mean to say piecemeal, where you've done staff toilet improvements or students, you can see there's been efforts to do it. Uh, and what's so frustrating is that you all know the drop-down grab bar in most of our, uh, most so of our accessible toilets. <laughs> Some have it, and then even as you'd say, oh great, it's got a drop-down grab bar, that means it's a contemporary restroom. Well, four years ago, Connecticut then inserted yet another grab bar in that same toilet space. It's a very short one on the side, and so we're technically not in compliant, even though you see a drop-down grab bar. Great, we're, we're, we're compliant. We aren't, because there's always something that they're sticking in every three or four years. So it's almost impossible to stay proactively ahead of it like you're implying. But again, there's no um, requirement that you comply. It's not like fire code, because it doesn't deal with life safety. It deals only with accessibility. Yes, Deanna. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Penny, go ahead and then Deanna. So are you going to ladder this into um, like a, a one, two, three, and four? Uh, not to, You have it by school, but by priority? We can, yes, because we, it's Excel spreadsheet. If you'd like us to, we can not only do the sort that you see, which is by system, architectural, mm -hmm. mechanical, electrical, we can then do another sort behind each one of the school subsections that shows them ranked by priority. So did you happen to sort and add up priority one and then priority two? Do we know what those all add up to? Um, no, no, no. You're yet. like totaling the cost of the one and two. Total of all the priority no, one no items. And the total no, of that's the, the totals. Two mm -hmm. items. Okay, mm -hmm. it'd be pretty easy. The, the only one I did that on was the mechanical slides because the numbers, you know, he was looking out 20 years and had big numbers. I right. just grabbed mm -hmm. the ones and twos and told you the numbers of those. Okay. For instance, here, 320. I didn't want you to think it was all mm -hmm. 2 million. <laughs> Great. Thank this is extremely helpful. Thank you so You're much. You're welcome. Tiana? I just have one other question about the um, East School um, tiles delaminating and the asbestos. And so if we wanted to, you know, sort of um, fix or replace those tiles, um, you know, are we headed to, you know, a whole environmental, um, you know, I, 
you know what my question is. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes, you're responsible for the whole environmental picture. And not only does that mean asbestos, which most of us don't even get excited about anymore, but as you do, dispose. It's not so much that you're abating it and you're concerned about what's in the, in the, in the air as you dispose mm -hmm. in the summer. The uh, EPA has, wants you to know what you're throwing out in the landfills which you, some of us could care less about to a degree. It just goes to a landfill, except the EPA wants you to be aware if there are PCBs. And of course, I know you've heard PCBs, and that unfortunately, even though we think, oh great, it's just an asbestos floor, log on it, there can be PCBs in the adhesives that are binding those old asbestos floors. So yes, Bob and his crew will be testing for not only asbestos, but PCBs. So whenever you're throwing out anything, whether it's the control joints on the sealant of the walls, whether it's the roofing, whether it's the window shades, uh, or the flooring, you have to know what's in your waste stream, and that means you have to be test and be aware of what's in it. So is that is that hundred and um, sorry hundred and two thousand dollars? Does that include an environmental abatement, or is that it doesn't uh, include? Yes, it does include abatement. It's yes. best to yes. yep. Just as best yeah. okay. Because we like to be optimistic that PCBs are not that pervasive that we okay. want to burden you with the heavy costs that go with PCBs. And in all of our schoolwork throughout the state, PCBs is not that rampant that we would say there's better than a 50% chance you're going to be stuck. It's not that high yet. It's uh, mostly pervasive and mostly in outside materials but it seems like every other year that schools continue to do their air, indoor air quality, they're finding it in some of the most hideous places, fireproofing, interior paints, uh, places like that. We've also heard that the state is making moves, the State Department of Health is making moves to take control of PCBs and their regulation from the feds so that it is not as, um, tough an issue as it is right now, uh, like for instance that we're going through at South. Uh, the EPA involvement uh, adds a lot of time and a lot of money and hopefully if the state within two years can roll it back into more state control, it should be a lot more manageable a cost. Mm. Thank you. Okay, other questions? Yes, Allison. Can you just quickly clarify for your priority ranking what the criteria Sure. What's for your ranking? I mean, I'm assuming safety. I'm just wondering what else went into that. Okay, you can look on page eight of the report. There's a breakdown of it, too. One is an urgent priority. We feel it should be corrected as soon as possible. It's most likely a health or life safety issue. And two is a high priority. It means we see something coming to the end of its useful life in one to three years. And three is moderate, three to five years. And then a low priority is about five to ten years. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Scott. As I look over the priority ones, the things that jump out at you quickly, of course, are the oil tanks, which are a hundred and something thousand piece, hundred twenty-five, hundred fifty. And then there's a four hundred thousand dollar sprinkler number. Yes. I apologize that that's actually in there. We kind of had it to the side. Um, it was meant to be not included in the total. I did take that out now, so in the next one you get, it won't be in there. Um, mm. They. We were asked to provide a cost on what it would be to introduce a sprinkler system. Not that you need to. That's so. That's all it was. It was. It was meant to go up with the architectural one where I'm talking about courtyard egress. So it was just. In I the took wrong it out. Place. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, it's a thank you very much for the thoroughness of this. Uh, it's been very helpful, and especially having the priorities, and then giving us how many years ahead. To, as a heads up as to the clock was ticking on things. <laughs> right. And so that's very helpful to us. We're trying to take care of our capital needs and yet not everything can be done at once. <laughs> And, and certainly remember, if you can't remember, three or four years down the road, all our prices are based on 2015 prices. Oh, cool. So as two years from now, as you're picking up the yeah. list again, try to remember to escalate your costs. <laughs> we can't do it for you because we don't know when you're going to pick up yes. the relative priorities. So always make a mental note to have you know, the staff uh, escalate mm -hmm. for the appropriate time that you plan on implementing it. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. So our challenge going forward is to take the report and to prioritize and, and look it over and make some decisions around what our, you know, our five-year capital planning will be. Uh, we'll use Bill and Michelle's priorities as a guide as we're going through and doing that, and there'll be lots of conversation amongst all of us along the way.
Thank you. Moving on to our next item, agenda item for tonight. We have a STEM update. And would you, are you going to introduce everybody or? Actually, I think Dr. Carenti is going oh, to. Oh, all right, Dr. Carenti, excuse me. Thank you. Well, as our committee members are getting situated, I just want to um, remind everybody that this is really going to be an extension of what we began last week during our budget workshop in talking about our STEM program. And this evening, we're going to be giving you an update on where we are with district goal number one, um, objective number three, um, where we're talking about the implementation of the national and state science framework, where we are in that regards to that, where we are in regards to our STEM initiative, um, the expansion and the program that we've uh, implemented over at SACS possible expansion up at the high school. I know there were some questions that were raised uh, last week, and we have Mr. Zamborano here who will be able to answer some of those questions for you. And then we'll talk about how we'll be continuing our integration and expansion at the elementary school. So we do have many committee members here this evening, and I do want to take a moment to introduce them. Um, sitting in the audience is Pat Kimmerling, who is a five through eight tech technology integrator over at Sachs Middle School. Uh, Zoe Robinson is our K through eight math coordinator. Anthony Bloss is the department chair for math at the high school. And presenting this evening is Vivian Birdsell, who is our new STEM teacher over at Sachs Middle School. Jim Zamborano, who is the department chair for career and technology education. Christian Dockham, who is our, math, our science department chair at the high school. And Melinda Meyer, who is our K through eight science coordinator. So I'm gonna turn it over to them and then we'll hopefully be able to answer your questions and give you a thorough update for this evening. Good evening, thanks for having us tonight. Uh, I wanted to start off tonight by just addressing um, the next generation science standards. Uh, these standards were developed uh, based on a document uh, created by the uh, National Research Council, the K-12 uh, science frameworks. Um, and really they are proposing a new vision for science learning for our students and science instruction for our teachers. Uh, and that vision is based on the integration of three dimensions uh, of science and engineering. Uh, the science and engineering practices, which will be uh, explained and discussed a bit uh, later on. Cross-cutting principles, sort of the overarching principles of, of science, and then the disciplinary core ideas, which are the content ideas uh, discussed within that uh, framework. Um, really, the, the framework was developed to provide a coherent, aligned progression in both content and skills K-12. So it starts with a set of science content and skills in kindergarten, and there's a, a progression up through high school to uh, 12th grade. And as the, the students move through that progression, it becomes um, uh, more progressively deeper in understanding and, and more complex as we look at this, both the skills and uh, content area. Um, another step uh, that has been made is the inclusion of both engineering practices and engineering core ideas within the standards themselves. So it's not just a set of science standards, it's really an integration of both engineering concepts and engineering core ideas that can be integrated directly into science classes. And, and that integration is an expectation within the uh, next generation science standards. So when it comes to our, our students, uh, really the, the science standards are based on student performances. And so the standards themselves are actually a performance standard. So every standard is something that a student would have to perform. And they're really a combination of all three of those dimensions, the, the science and engineering practices, the cross-cutting principles, and the disciplinary core ideas. So every student performance is going to have an integration of one or more of each dimension within the performance itself. And I hope to give you an example of what one of those performances might look like uh, later on. Here we have a, a comparison of the science and engineering practices. And I guess most importantly, uh, 
for me to point out is how similar they are. Um, and, and really, in the Next Generation Science Standards document, they're really um, put together as one set of practices. So they're science and engineering practices as opposed to being science practices and engineering practices. Um, a couple of the differences, as you can see, the practice one for science is asking questions. The engineering practice, the corollary, would be uh, defining a problem. Um, for the, uh, the second difference is in step six, where you are constructing an explanation um, for a certain phenomenon. The corollary in the engineering practices would be to design a solution that might solve that problem that you have defined. So you can see that there's a great similarity on both sides of, of that line, but there are some slight differences as to whether you're doing a, a science type activity or an engineering type activity throughout. One other difference that uh, needs to be discussed is sort of the idea that the science practices are, are developed for describing a, a scientific phenomenon. So for example, the science practices you could use to determine why we have day and night. And so as you go through and you're constructing your explanation, you're really constructing an explanation based on the phenomenon that is the rotation of the Earth. So there's really one specific answer or one specific content piece for that phenomenon. Whereas on the engineering practices, you're looking at a variety of possible solutions. So there is no one best way to keep a, a cup of coffee insulated. There's going to be a variety of different solutions that could uh, keep that coffee warm in, in that particular example. We also wanted to sort of give you a sense of how the science and engineering practices um, align and are related to the common core standards for math and the mathematical practices there. So on the left you see I've sort of um, squished together the science and engineering practices and then for comparison put the eight mathematical practices. Um, there's really some very similar pieces within both uh, sets of practices. So for example, uh, the science practice seven, engaging an argument from evidence, is, is very similar to the mathematical practice number three, where you're constructing viable arguments um, and critiquing the reasoning of others. Um, science practice two, developing and using models, is very similar to the model with mathematics, practice number four. So you see there's very, uh, some similarities between the two. Um, there's also some, some convergences that are not necessarily as easy to see within the two documents. Uh, so for example, practices five, six, and seven are, are primarily mathematical practices. Um, they would be uh, focused on in a math course, and you might not necessarily see them in a science course, uh, but the science practices certainly include elements of these practices, but they're applied to uh, the scientific context. So um, using appropriate tools strat uh, strategically might be different in a math class than it would be in a science class, but you'd certainly want to be able to measure using a ruler and, and determine an appropriate tool to do a certain measurement in a science class. So we talked a little bit about an example, and what I wanted to, to provide is an example of how these engineering and science practices may be turned into an activity that you might see in a science classroom. Um, and so what you see here is a engineering activity that you might see in a classroom, whether it's at the middle school or at the high school, where you're uh, looking at a, a physical science concept, uh, the use of forces, and, and you're designing and building a, uh, in this case, a glider or a paper airplane that can uh, fly a horizontal distance of 2x when held at a height of 1x. And, and so really there is no perfect solution. There could be a variety of different gliders that your students construct. Um, the, the key here is that they're designing, they're solving, and then they're using the evidence to both model what they're doing and design explanations for those scientific concepts that are at play in this particular activity. Um, some of the words here are highlighted in different colors. So the purple here in this case, make sure I get this right. Uh, the purple are, are some disciplinary core ideas. Uh, the design and build would be an uh, engineering 
core idea uh, that would be developed into any uh, science course, and the forces would be a physical science core idea. So that would like lay out the content of that, that particular activity. The red uh, text would be the science practices or engineering practices that are found within the activity. And, and then there's cross-cutting principles throughout. So for example, uh, energy and matter, uh, systems and systems models, scales and proportionality, all examples of, of large cross-cutting concepts that, that could be uh, investigated and, and looked at through this uh, type of activity. I guess most importantly for, for us is where Connecticut is in the adoption process for our next generation science standards. Um, right now there's over 80 districts involved. Um, there's three state committees, a, a district advisory committee that is primarily science leaders, um, department chairs, science coordinators, uh, uh, assistant principals from districts across the, the state. There's an assessment committee looking at possible assessments for uh, the next generation science standards. And then there's a performance task committee looking at how we might uh, take some of these ideas and turn them into performance-based assessments as a, as a means for assessment. Uh, at the last district advisory committee, we were given sort of the early 2015 timeline for a state decision as to uh, what direction Connecticut is going to move in regards to the NGSS. Um, there's really two choices now that they're looking at, um, an adapt choice and an adopt choice. And an adapt choice would mean that something is changing with the uh, standards as they're currently written. Either there's going to be additions or subtractions or they're going to change the format or change the order, uh, but something is changing. And to be honest, the state doesn't know what changes um, are going to be made at this point, but the adapt would be uh, something is changing from that original document, as opposed to adopt, which would be a wholesale adoption of the standards as currently written um, and as they've been presented. Um, in any case, there is going to be a change from the current state frameworks, uh, science frameworks, uh, and whenever that change is made, there'll be a three to five year transition that is based on the uh, changes in instruction, changes in curriculum, changes in uh, teaching, uh, certifications, changing in assessment, and, and really changing in the professional development. And that, that needs to be brought in in terms of the amount of time that teachers are going to need to sort of take this new concept and mold it into something that can be uh, presented in a way to, to really uh, be best for our students. Thank you. Christian has provided you with a foundation for, uh, understanding of some of the comparisons between the mathematical practices and the scientific and engineering practices. And this, can, this integration can be known as STEM, which is looking at the integration between science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And how our students um, perform to demonstrate this integration could be in um, some examples already found within our curriculum. For example, in fourth grade, our students design an alarm system that protects your valuables. In second grade, they determine the ideal growing systems for plants. In first grade, they use code to program their Lego robotics. And in sixth grade, um, our students just finished uh, designing models of water filtration systems. When the board presented to us uh, the goals for this year, one of them was to establish a STEM program at the middle school. Um, and in doing that, we need to create a framework of STEM education K-12 in New Canaan. Uh, so that process took place over the summer with a committee um, that was presented to you earlier today. And we spent days uh, looking at the national frameworks that Christian mentioned, the NGSS, as well as um, the ISTE, which is the technology frameworks, um, and at PISA, some of the international frameworks, to find out what are the common threads that link science, techn technology, engineering, and math together that we can assess students against. The strands presented on the slide here represent um, the work that we did. And the strands that we came up with, which represents the K-12 STEM um, framework uh, for developing curriculum. Uh, so we looked at the ideas of systems, 
Um, and in systems, students look at parts that make up a whole and how they integrate together in both the design and natural worlds. Um, Vivian Berthold is going to talk a little bit more about the design process, but the design process is a systematic way for students to think through a problem in order to come up with the diverse solutions that Christian mentioned, um, look at the constraints that um, and limitations of their different models, and then try to narrow all those different solutions down to one, and then look at that model and determine the strengths um, and constraints of that model. Within communication, we're really building off of the idea that we um, have how to prepare our students to represent themselves and be competitive within the, um, the global market. So how are you going to share what it is that you're trying to do, why you're doing it, and who needs to be able to use it? Um, the idea is citizenship is looking at, again, looking at digital citizenship and how you're re reacting to different cultures, um, as well as being responsible with the use of the technology that you're implementing. Um, and then we brought in the idea of the cross-cutting elements from science called patterns. And patterns is looking at how can we take, even in the design or natural world, something that's repeating over and over again, and use that in order to find out what's going to happen with the system if you change something, what might, uh, um, what, how, that, how might that be affected. Um, once we have this established, then we can go in and we can build the programming. So the results that your students are now living within the middle school uh, is grounded within those strands. And Vivian, Pat, and myself were able to take a look at developing course design for STEM explorations, which our students are getting in grades uh, six, seven, and eight, as well as um, looking at the Project Lead the Way course. Hi. Um, so just kind of refresh, this is year 14 for Project Lead the Way. So we've been doing STEM for quite a while here. Um, and I'm just going to talk to you about what is currently kind of evolving uh, at the high school. So we are offering this year computer science and software engineering. Um, and it is currently not a college board AP exam, but will be next year. So we will uh, have the kids sit for that next year. Uh, and in the meantime, the college board, along with Project Lead the Way, uh, are building these other two courses within computer science. Uh, the first one, the intro, introduction to computer science, can be either taught at the middle school level or the high school level. Uh, it's a, I think it's a 20 week uh, program, I'm trying to read it there quickly. Uh, sorry, one semester, so, so yeah, 20 weeks. So it would be two modules in the middle school uh, or uh, one semester at the high school. And then the second one, is what's currently being tested as an AP computer science uh, is a curriculum that mirrors that, but by Project Lead the Way called computer science applications. So that is the goal to move forward with those three course offerings at the high school and or middle school. Um, so next year they will sit for the, the college AP exam um, in computer science principles, and then either the following year or the year after, either one or two years to transition to uh, com computer science applications. I think simultaneously there is, we haven't totally talked this through yet, uh, the intro to computer science can happen at the same time if it's done at the middle school. Um, components of that go into FTEs and room usage uh, at the high school. So that needs to really be thought out. Uh, and, and this all comes through visiting other schools, talking with their AP programs, uh, and non-AP programs. What, what else is out there? Um, and that's my piece. They made me promise to be brief. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I'm very excited about the class that I'm teaching this year. Um, the kids are too. When you walk into my room, it's just kids drool as they walk around with, the, with all of the equipment that's in there. Um, so we have embedded STEM opportunities for five through eight. Um, we've got the, the um, Project Lead the Way automation and robotics and the design and modeling piece, which is actually a 3D Autodesk CAD program. Um, that students take for one semester and then we'll switch out and for the second two marking periods we'll, I'll have another class. 
Um, we have the STEM exploration classes, which last for, um, we just keep bringing groups of kids in for three weeks at a time. That's for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And then we had, we're still doing after school clubs. Instead of doing two days a week now, we're doing three days a week. I thought I could cut back to one day, but didn't work out. And of course, we have the summer camps. This year, I did a flight club um, with our beautiful flight simulator, one of our beautiful flight simulators. And um, our kids built three more flight simulators. So um, there's tons of, tons and tons of opportunities and ways for kids to get, kind of get into this, this particular STEM room, which is so exciting and, and just, just the best place to be. I'm afraid Greg's going to come to me at the end of the year and say, you've been playing with kids all year? <laughs> you haven't done any real work? <laughs> but I think I've done real work because um, Jonathan Costa's slide, I thought I would steal it for this presentation, um, talks about um, critically thinking, clear communication, complex problem solving, and um, all of that, that's all happening um, while we're doing um, all these different projects. Um, in the STEM exploration, we go through all of the pieces that I have in the, in the um, room for them. They can build a computer. I, we're on our eighth computer this year that we're building. Um, they can fly a flight simulator, but they have to actually go through the ground school with me as a certified flight instructor. They um, can code. They can, do, um, they can um, build an app, which we're working on. We're also working on the invention convention. They can, um, there's just pretty much 3D printing, AutoCAD, just pretty much anything you could think of is in that room. But the kids come up with different things. So how do you put all that together, and how do you really um, help kids understand how to think because just doing a project isn't the point. The point is really learning how to do all those things that Jonathan Costas talked about last, the last time with thinking and communication and collaboration and, and real problem solving. So while I continue to talk, I made a video <laughs> so you could see it. And I kind of lost the thing, so. Here it is. Um, we turned off the sound so you could hear me. But these are, these are pictures of our wonderful um, classes and kids actually working through different problems. The first thing we do is that when we're looking at any of the, any of the projects, including the project Lead the, Lead the Way, is we define the, pro the problem. Why are we doing this? What's the purpose? What's our goal? How can I help this particular this particular idea come to fruition for whatever reason. And then we get together and we, cut, we generate um, ideas. So you're, we're generating concepts. We first we kind of write things out and think about things individually and then come back to our group. And everybody has their own ideas and now we've got to learn to collaborate and pull things back together and maybe come up with a completely different idea that lets all of these things come through. So after that, we've got to develop a solution, okay? Now we're moving, we're moving into how are we going to build this? Now that, we're going, now that we've decided what we're going to do, how are we going to do this? And um, so we're constructing a prototype and actually testing the prototype, evaluating if our solution did what it needed to do, and finally presenting a solution. So when we present that solution, now we've moved out, actually out of the whole idea of using math and using science and using all of those skills. And now we have language arts skills that we have to deal with. Because presenting anything, how, what's the best way to present it? Who was your audience when you started? How are we going to do this? Are we going to use a PowerPoint? Are we, are we going to have to write a report? So we do all of those different things once the projects are done. So. Um, I just did a kind of a quick um, overview with the kids. And this is what my room looks like every day. And it's actually what my room looks like even when there aren't classes going on. The kids come for lunch. They come after school, even on the days that they're not supposed to come after school. They're just, my room never sleeps, and, which, is, which was my idea from the beginning. I think you heard me say that. I want, I want this program to be something that's exciting all the time. So from early in the morning until after four in the afternoon, there's, there's kids in there. And um, 
they're not only having a great time, they're actually learning to think. They're learning to collaborate. They're learning mm -hmm. to problem solve. And um, when you see this year's Tech Night, I think you're going to be very mm -hmm. impressed. Um, not that we always aren't impressive on Tech Night, but um, this just it's just kind of come full circle for me. And uh, I've got more kids this time. I think I filled this room for the past two years mm -hmm. with kids um, on Tech Night. But this time it's going to be pretty special because we have close to 200 kids who probably have something con to contribute. So I'm excited. And there's only a couple more minutes if you want to watch. <laughs> You've heard about STEM in the high school um, and at the middle school. I'm going to be able to share a little bit about the elementary school to you right now. Um, we also have STEM embedded within the core content areas. And I share some examples with you before about alarm systems. Um, but when I mentioned to you about the ideal growing system, our second graders are diving deeper into hydroponics. So what are some other alternative ways to grow when you don't have viable soil opportunities? So the best way to grow is in soil, but sometimes that's, that's not um, an option for you. So what are some other ways? Within every, um, so that's just one example, within every unit um, or every grade level within the elementary schools, they have this real world problem to tackle. Um, and sometimes it's modeling and sometimes it's creating and sometimes it's just exploring the pros and cons to alternative energy through using some of the common core um, argument and research standards. So there's a lot of different ways that the students in the elementary schools are also accessing STEM ideas and following that design process that Vivian walked us through before. Um, there are also numerous enrichment opportunities for them as well. So they have um, before and or after school clubs, depending on the school, that might ha include the Legos uh, robotics. Um, they have STEAM night at East School that's upcoming in February. Uh, they have, again, the opportunity to engage in Tech Night, um, which is a K-12 event. And then they have numerous camp opportunities within the summer enrichment programs um, from something called Camp Invention, which changes every year the, uh, the different frame that that's uh, created under. Uh, they have lights, camera, action. So students are kind of thinking about movie making, but again, through the lens of that technology and that science. How are you using light or how are you using music to kind of create that emotion within um, the movies that you see? Uh, and then they have a variety of other options. Now that we have Project Lead the Way established in the middle school and the high school, we can um, offer Project Lead the Way camps um, to kind of support a filtering, um, a feeding program into the middle and the high school. And we are ever growing K-8. So we are so excited to share with you. And I know you heard some of, um, of this at the budget workshop last week. Um, there's numerous ways that we're going to continue to embed STEM in the core curriculum, which is the science and math curriculum um, and the technology areas. And those are really um, in two different uh, areas. One is the performance-based assessments. These are ways that students are demonstrating or performing these, this integration of the science, technology, and engineering skills. So when I mentioned to you earlier about grade six developing a water filtration system, this is an example of a performance-based assessment for them. Um, grade six is also about to enter into a watershed activity where students are um, identifying where their water flows um, in an area of town and talk about um, the, uh, at the contributions and the celebrations that we have on um, the effects that we have on water usage. We also will have uh, more performance-based assessments being designed in the elementary school. So we're really supporting that work. Um, in grades five, we're going to introduce, we're considering introducing Project Lead the Way so that we have a more of a continuous program design through the middle school and into the high school. Uh, and that would be a robotic, uh, uh, twist to the grade five program. Um, and we have some lead teachers being trained so that we can train the teacher's model um, within the fifth grade, as well as going down looking at some third grade and fourth grade modules. The Project Lead the Ray program for the elementary is called Launch. So when you start to see that terminology, that's what, what um, it's being called. The extensions that we're looking for is to uh, take a look at the workshop model that currently exists at Sachs Middle School and use um, our science teachers as a way to integrate STEM into that workshop model so that STEM is accessible to all the students. Um, whether you're taking a course or different arts, um, you'll be able to experience the STEM. And then the other enrichment opportunities is um, community involvement and outreach. We have in New Canaan a great 
wealth of knowledge and also experience in, within our community. And we want to be able to tap into those resources to share them with our students and see where can those career choices take us. Uh, so we have a survey that we're going to provide to the community, um, hopefully through our schools and then through word of mouth to really access uh, people who can talk to us about the STEM professions that they're in. And this can open up a lot of doors for our students. We can have authentic audiences to talk to our students who are doing performance-based assessments. We have guest speakers that can come and talk to any of these clubs or these enrichment opportunities or to the students who are involved in STEM night. And then we also have the option of taking a look at um, the different uh, companies that are out there for extending our research programs or our internship programs. Um, so we're really trying to get the word out to the community that we want to know who's out there and how we can use them best um, and to kind of complete that survey for us. And these are the resources. If you're looking to learn a little bit more about STEM education and what's out there, um, these are some great resources for you to consider uh, that kind of known in the industry of um, places to go for STEM education. Thank you. What a dynamic pro program just from kindergarten all the way through, and it's really exciting to hear about it. I know that there are probably some questions and things that people on the board want to say or to ask. Anybody, Penny? Yes, um, how do we, uh, as the Board of Ed, I mean, all these initiatives are wonderful, but how do we determine and measure if we're moving ahead at the right pace and if we should be saying, this is great, um, but maybe we should be looking in this area? I mean, what are the, how should we be assessing it? Is there a way we can share the microphone? Is there a smaller, a portable? Is that one? I think what's detached? important is it's going back to our national standards. So we always go back and we take a look at the next generation science standards and we look at where those standards are going. We also look at all those critical elements that we're teaching all of our youngsters. We know that the route in which people are going are more towards those problem-based assessments. We know that we're going to be facing um, real-life situations that children have to problem-solve and create a solution and go through that process. So when we're creating our curriculum in regards to this, everything is going back to what we know about research-based um, programs, um, what we know about standards, and then how we best feel it's going to help to integrate within the Nicana Public Schools. We're always very considerate of the time, and integration is really critical. We just can't keep adding more on. So the way that we try to figure out how to integrate within the elementary schools into the science and the math programs, that's really important for us. We look at the same with the middle school. We try to do that integration for them, um, and we know that we can offer unique opportunities for them as well when they can really expand out into one of those areas. So it's all based on research. It's all based on standards um, that we're following. And I'm not sure if that answers your question. I mean, I think that Jim is always out visiting other communities. Um, Melinda um, is always researching other communities. We have a network with Project Lead the Way. We can always find out which schools have access to that. Um, we have information as far as what DERG um, other communities within our DERG are doing in regards to STEM programming, computer um, programming, coding. Um, so we're constantly looking at all of that as well. Uh, button on the top. So I, I think it's a difficult. Hello? Are we on? Yeah, you're on. Yes, you're on. You're on. How do you measure success, right, as far as student growth? So that's, to me, that we have assessments throughout all, right, national, right? So we can tie it all back to that. But how do we know that what we're doing is the best thing for our students? It's a very difficult question to answer. Um, we do the best based on what we know. Um, but how, then how do you go and assess that? And I think for me that's why that question is a great question, uh, and I think it's a national question. I think that that's what we try to do every year. We try to do our best. We try to focus on what we believe is correct based on, again, what we're saying nationally, uh, what we say in this community, what does this community want and need. Um, but for, for <laughs> that was a good question. Uh, difficult to answer. How do we assess whether that was the right decision or not? Uh, I don't know if we track the kids through college and then you know, into the real world. And is that how you answer the question? I don't know if that's the right answer either. 
And well, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly if this is what Penny was intention, but I think you know, for me, I was looking at that is that as we're looking at all these different great projects, and I think you've, it's wonderful what you proposed in terms of integrating with the school system and everything else. Um, is this where, uh, where where do we lie? I think Joe was, uh, Dr. Crenshaw was mentioning that, you know, you've looked at other districts and how we're doing and stuff. Are we, you know, are we kind of at the lead? Are we in the middle? Are we with everybody else? Are we moving at a good pace? Do we need to go faster or, uh, you know, how we do it kind of, and I'm not sure if that. Well, I would, I would, throw in also that I think the success of a program is often measured in, it's best measured in student-based outcomes, right? What the students are doing now as a result of what they're learning that they weren't doing before. Uh, we heard Vivian talk just a minute ago about how many students she thinks is, are going to be a part of Tech Night that we have. Um, we talk about often about um, students signing up and, and the sections we offer of the computer science course at the high school the new Project Lead the Way course and how we may, didn't have enough room. We look at the sort of what students, how students are approaching the problems that they're faced in the course of their school day. Are they using a more scientific method as they're solving problems and working through issues, working in their math class and their science classes? Are they more familiar? And are we able to take them further as a result of their, um, their introduction and their working in, in some of these areas. Um, we met with our seniors today, some of the graduates that came back, and um, just about everyone in the room was a humanities major in one way or the other. Um, that speaks to me that we're on the right path and doing more programming maybe around STEM and starting at a young age and working that through. Uh, the, but I think there are lots of ways that we can see kind of the outcome. Uh, we've been working with the Tri-State on uh, performance assessment design initiative for the last couple of years, PADI, uh, which you've heard about. And that is look taking, sort of integrating disciplines and asking students to, uh, to show us what they know and they can do in the disciplines and across the disciplines through performance assessment, performance-based assessment that we're doing with them. So I think uh, when we see the difference, we see the improvement in what we're doing, the outcome of that and student-based uh, what they're, how they're working, what they're doing, how they're addressing challenges that they're faced. Uh, and we do look across, we work, we partner with other districts, we talk about what, they'll, what they're doing, we think about how that can enhance and improve what we're doing. Um, I, it's, you know, I think it, it's more in cooperation than to say we're number three in STEM integration. Um, but you know, I think that we are absolutely on the right path. And the looking at Looking at it similar to the way years ago we looked at world language with the FLESS program and sort of worked to develop a literacy around world language and um, you know, a proficiency for all, stu all graduating students. I think it's, it makes sense to use a similar type of lens here as we talk about STEM and looking at it as a uh, you know, common experience for all of our students as they come up in the earlier grades so that they have those tools and they're able to apply them as they go across the disciplines as they get older. We would hope that it would lead to more students being interested in our Project Lead the Way courses and other courses that we offer. Um, but if it does for those students, great. But I think for all of the students, it gives them another way to process and to work through challenges that they're faced in school and outside. And so I think there are, there are ways to look at it. Um, it's not necessarily quantifiable as far as a test goes or you know, those types of things, but I think we can see, see the progression as we continue doing the integration. Yes, Gene. Uh, Project Lead the Way, I believe, is a, a nonprofit organization providing curriculum material for STEM oriented courses. Sometimes when we get the presentation, so I, I almost get a sense that it, it's, it's, it's something else in addition here, but I'm asking for clarification. For instance, you talk about the uh, curriculum and course design at the middle school, Project Lead the Way, STEM exploration. Is, when you refer to Project Lead the Way, is it, again, just a reference to a course developed by the PL, uh, P, PLTW organization that you're using in STEM, or is it something else? Project Lead the Way has its own curriculum. Yes. So although we're using Autodesk, which is a 3D modeling program that will actually 3D use to create things to 3D print, we use their curriculum to teach to teach the course. Okay. So it is it is not a project within the school system here. It is just no. again a reference to uh, their curriculum. It's a, yeah. It's a it's a national curriculum. Any other questions? Well, it's, it's more of a comment. Um, 
I'm really excited about this program and the way that it's getting integrated across the whole, you know, K through 12. Um, you know, kids today, well, anyone, you know, they get very excited, especially young children when it's more of a hands-on. You know, you go to take them to a museum where you say, look at this, and you take them to a museum where they can actually go in and try and experiment stuff. And they get so much more out of that. You know, it's a great way of learning, and I'm glad to see we're going towards more real-life applications mm -hmm. and teaching at a young age, too, because a lot of times that's the way you keep kids engaged in education, you know, rather than just saying, here's a bunch of information you need to know, and they're kind of like, well, what do I do with this, you know? And so from the get-go, if you kind of show them that this is why we're learning it, and this is how you can apply it, and then as you kind of go through what you're mentioning that was the, uh, Mr. Costa had presented too, is about really learning about this critical thinking, because again, we're looking at what our younger kids are going to be going and doing. We don't know. The, the technology is changing, the careers are changing, and so as long as we know they'll succeed if they develop those critical thinking, the um, other components you know, that are really important no matter what job they take, and the more we can get them into this kind of thinking, and this again, this is a very tangible, something that kids can really relate to, is fabulous. I'm glad that we're integrating it, you know, and I would support, you know, keep moving in this direction. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I keep thinking about the tech night and your discussion about how it's grown and grown and watching how the enthusiasm of the kids and I, the same thing that Sangeeta's saying, just to see that is so exciting and to know that there's now so many more kids that are all involved in the projects and working on them. And I know that in speaking with Vivian about the enthusiasm of the kids, you have to look out in the hall. You, uh, you should probably tell you where you described to me, you have to watch when the kids are coming to the class because they'll run over you. They're so excited to get there. Uh, that's the enthusiasm that we'd love to see in science. And so it is an exciting thing for us to see and to hear about. Are there other questions? It comes. Allison. Uh, just, sorry, one quick one. Um, when I look at a program like this, there's two things we kind of look at. One is <clears throat> at each individual grade level what's offered. And then the second piece is basically the flow from, from grade to grade to grade. Do we feel, I, I imagine we feel that we're pretty comfortable with the flow that we currently have in terms of the program? Because I know like Project Lead the Way, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think once you kind of lock into it in the high school, you're, you're in it. You're in it or you're out. Is, is that correct? Or uh, Not exactly. So we, we try to have the kids take at least three Project Lead the Way classes before taking the engineering design the capstone course, but that is not always true. Uh, we, in freshman year, the offering is intro to engineering and design, but sophomore, junior year, senior year even, they can take any of the other courses, any sequence they'd like. So what we find is we run at least two sections of the intro every year, mm -hmm. some, some years three, that we get about half of those kids to continue on, and, they can, and then after that second year, it's almost 100% continue on again. Um, so it's just the first year where, where the kids are trying it out, see if they like it, and then if not, you know, they, they try something else, and the kids that stayed, we, we, we push them forward. Um, but it's not to say that I don't have uh, seniors in my intro to engineering class or the computer science class. It's really uh, uh, sophomores through seniors. This year, uh, we didn't put that stipulation on it, so there's a, there is one freshman in the computer science course uh, doing well. Did that answer? That's fine. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Are there other questions from the board? People have things. Scott? You know, the only comment I would make is, obviously, it's, um, I'm a big believer in the whole STEM side of, of what we do here. And uh, there's a lot of people, you touched on it briefly, when you get into some of the opportunities outside of the classroom, some of the things you're doing in the afternoon, where you, where you can involve the community and maybe the high school kids as well can come down to the lower grades, which will further, you know, embed all of the things that the practices that they've come up with. Um, and I would encourage you to do as much of that as possible. I know that the community is anxious to help and they're out there. And um, so anything you know that we can do to help that, help facilitate that would be more like. I think there's nothing more exciting when you're in second or third grade to go into a high school lab. You have to sort of watch the kids, but but it really is an exciting experience for them and uh, they can feel they can identify and perhaps one day be actually there doing something and working on themselves and see the older kids, I think, as Scott's suggesting. It's a, really, it's an exciting thing, good suggestion. If we, I think people on, that watch this program, I hope, that do come from a STEM background business or uh, if it's a personal interest, uh, who should they contact? Dr. Carenti? We'll be sending out a survey through the school, and there will be a contact person. We're going to be using a parent volunteer who's actually going to gather all of that information for us and start a database. Terrific. And we might want to use the, uh, some of the media so that people who don't have anyone in the schools, that would be terrific too, I assume. We'll be putting it on the district website, so we'll be sending it out to everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Deanna? 
I just wanted to <clears throat> echo a little bit of what Brian said earlier about meeting with the recent high school graduates and sort of the heavy humanities emphasis that we heard. And I think probably that'll be one of our um, touchstones later on to see how many more kids are coming back in sort of the math and sciences. And also it'd be interesting to track you know, and I'm sure we have some of that data already, but to see sort of what percentage of our graduates, are we seeing a growth in the number of kids pursuing sort of math and science degrees after they leave here? Because I think that'll sort of show what are we doing internally to prepare these kids and, and to excite them to go into those fields, so. One of the questions kind of going along with just the procession of courses and integration. At the high school, they also have a science and research uh, course where I know students get to do internships at laboratories and actually work in a lab and get some kind of science experience. Is that related or at all, or is that a separate thing, or do you have something similar that you can do with, you know, the computer science, or, or I mean, the engineering and other sciences? Right, that's a specific course um, that, uh, gives opportunities for some of our students to uh, learn how to read a scientific article and, and look at the, the process in which uh, an article is, is researched and, and written. Uh, and then as part of that course, they do have an opportunity for a, for a summer internship. Um, but I, I'm not, I guess I'm a there's nothing. There's no, there's no cotton. It's, it's, it, no, it, it, I mean, it's within our curriculum, and it certainly is an example of, of the integration of, of these science practices mm -hmm. and, um, and some of the, uh, the pieces that we've been looking at tonight, but it isn't a STEM specific, uh, uh course. And, and I guess there's one last thing that, I, that I'd like to, you know, really sort of nail down is the fact that the, the next generation science standards are, are designed to integrate the, the science and engineering practices. And, and they're really, throughout that entire document, um, thought of as one and the same. And, mm -hmm. and, and that in a science class, there may be an activity that makes more sense to, to follow those engineering practices and, and look at the design process as opposed to the, the scientific practices. So, uh, you know, that, that the NGSS is designed as a document to allow for a K-12 progression, and it's really designed to in, you know, implement both science and engineering into uh, a science curriculum. So, so sort of stepping away from the STEM courses as an as a individual um, section and really more focusing on these STEM ideas within the, the science uh, curriculum K-12. I just want to add that they can always do an independent study. If there's some interest that they have, uh, that there's always that option as well. So if, if they do really love and enjoy that research piece, they can always go further, always. Any other questions? I had one question also. I read about STEAM with the A in it for architecture or art, I guess. And is that something that we see happening in the future or is happening? Or what are your thoughts on that? So. It's, it, I believe it was California that, that, that threw the term out first, and it is the arts, uh -oh. it is not architecture, um, and it is something that the group has talked about mm -hmm. and, and looked at and, and where our focus will go. Uh, I don't know mm -hmm. that we're ready to really respond to that yet. We're in the process of exploring it as a committee. Yeah. Um, it's come up in conversation. It's certainly an integration component. Um, and I think of that Sachs wing in where that STEM lab sits, as well as all the art programs, and you think of the ongoing integration, and there was conversation even with Viv earlier in the school year um, on ways that we can try to figure out integration points. So um, some of it is dealing with scheduling and trying to figure that out, but certainly working towards the integration is, is really critical to all of us, too. Is, is that like a form and function component? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, where does the art come into, when you blend art and engineering, to me that's a form and function. It's, a, it's the difference between a good looking automobile and a lousy. <laughs> <laughs> it won't get you from point A to point B, but perhaps half more happily in one than the other. Is that the kind of aspect that we're talking about? It can be one aspect of it. Um, I've seen also people talk about form and function like you're describing, even looking at, at natural um, structures and how that then integrates into main structures. So if you look at sometimes um, tree design and how you have that really steady 
base trunk, but you have all the branches that come off. Um, some of the buildings now kind of have that narrow base and then branches that come off because they're trying to look at how you incorporate um, like the natural aspects of things into the man-made. Um, but Vivian can also go into detail too. The students kind of push the arts on into the STEM program itself because they come up with these ideas about um, clothing design and how to make um, your ski clothing stand out a little bit more um, in kind of the dusk time or when like light is reflecting off the snow in different ways and how can they do that. Um, there are students who say in hockey, girls uh, want to have, they need to have the goalie helmet, but they want the ponytail in the back of their head and that doesn't fit well in that helmet. So how can I redesign this so that it's feminine for a girl but also fitting for the hairstyle they need to have at the same time. So they push that envelope and bring um, that dimension to the STEM features. We have lots of ideas at SACS about integrating art, and it is, it, right now it looks like form and function, really. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that we're talking about is clothing that has, um, they have flat LED lights now that can go into clothing. So one of the things that we're, we're actually making right now is a bike jacket that we started last year, we never, actually, we never finished it, so we're finishing it this year. It has a, you have a little switch on your lapel, and if you switch it to the right, it means that you're, gonna, you're going to turn to the right, and the lights actually flash on the back of your jacket mm. in you know, an arrow pattern. And if you turn it to the left, it functions so the lights go to the left, so it's a turn signal on your jacket. And the girls have taken it just a little step further, so you'll see that at Tech Night. Um, they're designing. They're designing a gown that that's covered with LED light, flat <laughs> LED light. Uh, they're Pick sixth graders. They're yeah. going to do a great job. But, so. oh, I have a question. Along, does does music technology also fall into that? Because that's also you know a different art form, but falling with the technology and you know creating it. Or is that a different whole field? I don't. You know, I'm not no, sure how this it all is defined. No, it definitely does. We've got we've got some some of the kids working on a robot that um, that will dance to certain tunes, so to certain notes. We're looking at um, when the kids hit a certain note, lights, certain colored lights will light up. So these are all projects that the kids have come up with. These weren't anything that that um, especially the ball gown and the and um, and the lights coming on first, if you hit the pitch perfectly, a light will, will come on. Um, so these are not things I came up with at all. These are things the kids came up with. And one of the things that, that they say is, the, is um, the good thing about Ms. Burtzel is she never says no. So, <laughs> and it's true. That's why we're coming up with these wonderful things. So absolutely, you know, we're going to need those lights when we sing. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, and particularly we thank you for the leadership, Dr. Grenti, also. What a wonderful team that is working on this in the schools. And uh, as you leave, you can leave now if you want to. We understand you come very early in the morning. We see the cars out there already coming in at very early hours and know how early you are, so please feel free to, to leave at this time. Thank you. Thank you. You will miss the really interesting conversation on insurance. Yes. <laughs> yes. We have a good speaker. I was going to say, this is probably stay. <laughs> yes. Great. Dr. Lutzi, would you introduce well, our I'll do a little speaker. more of an intro, Scott, if that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, it is. <laughs> and that is a tough act to follow there, Steve. But, um, you know, as a, as a self-insured school district, as you know, our, the insurance number is the single largest item in our budget. So we thought as uh, we are embarking on this budget development season and, and system and process that it'd be a good idea for Steve to come in and to help us to understand uh, sort of how we're doing, how our plan is functioning, uh, provide us with an update and um, some things for us to consider as we think about the budget uh, going forward for 15, 16 and beyond and answer some questions for us. So, Steve, we appreciate your willingness to come out just a few nights before the holiday. <laughs> I have two exhibits coming around. 
I want to take this time also, while we're just in between here for a second, just to say thank you to the people who have come. On, I recognize some faces that have come who are part of different boards coming to hear their presentations, and we realize and appreciate that also before, right before the holidays, that your professionalism. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I was, kind of wanted to touch on um, a couple of things. One exhibit uh, presents where we think the FY16 budget should be, and we'll walk through that. The second exhibit kind of has the red on top, um, takes a look at where the reserve was at the end of last year, where we think it will be at the end of this year and going into next year. Wanted to mention that we're updating a few things for you. We don't have tonight, but we will next time we um, next time we come. You would ask for. You, you recall last year we did a survey of your peer districts, kind of what their risk retention posture is, what type of stop loss they have, what the, what the reserve policies are. So we're updating that. We'll also have various alternatives for the different stop loss programs, the individual level and the aggregate level, and what the pricing will that be. Um, and if you have any interest in talking about health care reform and what the district's doing with that, I'd be glad to comment on that. So I'll start with the, uh, the exhibit that has the blue on the top. So maybe starting in the middle column, you'll recall that the current health care budget for the FY15 current year is $10 million. We expect claims to be, by the end of the year, about 9.6 million in medical claims, 2.16 in drug claims, so total claims around 11.8. Then as a self-insured plan, you have some other costs to administer the plan. You have administration fees, stop loss premiums, contributions to the employee's HSA account, and some taxes and fees associated with health care reform. So in addition to the 11.8 in claims, we have about 2.3 in administrative fees and taxes and premiums for a total expected cost of 14 million, 14 one. We have various revenue items, employee contributions, retiree contributions, TRB payments to the district, something called a retiree subsidy from, the, from Medicare. Um, we expect that to come in a little under 3.2 million. So we think the total cost to run the plan will be about 10.9 million compared to our $10 million budget. So there'll be a deficit of about 900 or 925,000 drawing down the reserve. And that's pretty much exactly what was anticipated when you built the budget this time last year. We had asked for, or we talked about the need for about 10.9, and 10 million was the number um, that was decided upon, anticipating a $900,000 drawdown. So it looks like so far through five months, what was anticipated last year is developing. Kind of going forward into next year, the column on the right, we think a budget of 11.6 would fully fund all your costs. Now, obviously, 11.6 on your current $10 million budget is a pretty substantial increase, 1.6 million, or 16%. Just to compare that to kind of the same story we had last year, had the budget been fully funded, the 11.6 would be divided by 10.9, and it would be more of a kind of mid teen uh, six, six, six to seven percent increase relative to what the costs were for the current year and what the budget could have been. And all of that was anticipated. So we expect medical claims of about 10.3, prescription drug claims 2.3, so total claims of 12.6. That represents about a seven percent increase in claim cost. We have the same fees and stop loss premium. We would expect the fees to stay relatively flat. Stop loss premium um, we're building in about a 10%, 9 or 10% increase. Uh, those premiums tend to go up a lot faster because of the leveraging over the, over the $300,000 level. The employer contributions to the HSA would be about the same. Perhaps a few extra individuals would move into that plan. 
The healthcare fees are scheduled to come down uh, next year just based on, on the law. So we would expect fees and other costs to be about 2.3, total costs for 14.9. We would expect the increase in revenue due to higher premiums and some changes in the employee contribution percentages for a net cost of 11.6. So we would hope this improves somewhat as we get closer to um, July, but this is kind of what it looks like now. Stop and see if there are yes. any questions. Yes, why don't we do that? Just stop on that first sheet. Sure. Gene. Uh, Steve, looking at this with the, with the $900,000, which uh, we were cut last year, uh, and we went to reserves, if, uh, while it, as you say, it would be 6.7% on the total expected claims, if we had that 900000 or 162 without it, if we look at the very bottom number, though, it would appear that, in fact, we would have a, if we had the 900000 in last year's budget that, in fact, we would have ultimately a reduction in our budget for the coming year, i.e., if, if, if that 11.6, million point six on projected net health care costs was increased, I'm sorry, decreased by 900,000, oh, I'm sorry, if the 10.9 was increased by $900,000, the 11.6 would be a decrease. Am I looking at this correctly um, and understanding it correctly? I'm not sure. I, I probably didn't make it clear. The the eleven the eleven six is sort of independent of anything that happened currently. So we think eleven six is the number that's needed to fund next year without any any use of reserves or any use of funds from current budget. So right. But but if we had the nine hundred thousand dollars was if that was not cut, the uh, projected ten nine would have been eleven eight. Oh no, I'm sorry. It's it's the way the exhibit the the current budget is ten. It should have been 10.9, so the actual increase or the change from this year to next would be going from 10.9 to 11.6. You don't add the 900,000 to the 10.9, you add the 900,000 to the 10. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's probably the format of the budget, the format of the exhibit probably isn't the best. Gene, you said, okay, Penny? So on this page, it's showing that um, the employee contributions and other revenue that we get as compared to our total expenditures are about 22 percent. Um, and is that, is that a, a good place to be in our DERG? Um, how are we faring that way compared to, uh, you know, our peers? Well, that, that number is made up of a couple of things. It's made up of employee contributions. That's the biggest piece of it. Right. Retiree contributions. So um, other districts that have bigger retiree populations will have more revenue coming from retirees. Oh, okay. So though one might conclude that you're getting more revenue out of the population, in effect, that might be attributable to a big retiree population, okay. which isn't. So really, um, in terms of the contributions that your employees make compared to your DERG, you're in a good spot. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I saw it. Deanna? <clears throat> so we're just seeing a, um, a fairly significant increase in in claims this year. As I as I look at this number, I mean the run rate on on claims looks significantly higher. This year. Well, it's running about at about seven percent, <clears throat> which is over last year. You're saying over last year, if we were at the ten nine. Well, just just kind of, kind of comparing the, the claim numbers. For example, we're projecting ten three medical claims compared to nine six. Right. Or two, three drug claims compared to two, one. So we're anticipating, you know, fairly trend-like increases in in claims. And is that <coughs> typical? Do we generally see a seven percent increase each year just because of the nature of, of expenses for the claims, or these are just sicker population? Or I'm not. the the consensus, the the term in in the industry is referred to as trend factors. What what is the anticipated per capita increase in claim costs from one year to the next. And so, so the consensus number probably is around 8% for medical, and now about 12 or 13% for prescription drugs. And we could talk about you know, there's, there's a kind of a hepatitis C ex cost explosion going on and some specialty drug issues with respect to cancer drugs. So th the, the anticipation is that, is that drug costs are going to move probably in the teens, although we're still keeping this 7% assumption kind of built in here, which it's a fairly cons it's a fairly aggressive assumption at this point, but that but yes to answer your question that's a fairly consistent 
number. So, so just to clarify for maybe people at home, because this is a very confusing topic, if we had fully funded the health insurance benefits last year and at the 10-9 level, um, we would be seeing about an, a 7% increase in our overall health care expenses. But because they were, we had to draw down the reserves, or it, they were basically underfunded, and we drew, we're seeing a big increase, but it's really not as big of an increase. It was because we didn't fund the full level of our health care expenses last year. Is that a fair? That's exactly mm -hmm. correct. Okay. Yes. I just want to make it more simple. Mm -hmm. Another question, Scott. Get any data that's leading us to understand better the HSA program over what we had prior. Is it still too early? Have we? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I think it's fair to say that the, S the HSA outperformed the PPO plan. It was good that we did what we did. Um, you're limited to what kind of HSA plan, or you were limited to what kind of HSA plan it could be, given the collective bargaining constraints that you've had to deal with. So I think, I think we can conclude that that was a good thing to do, and hopefully we can improve upon it. You know, the next time you get you get a shot at it. So I, so I think yes, we have enough information to conclude that. Penny, you might be getting it to it on the next sheet, but I just, are we where you think we should be on our, um, the insurance level for the aggregate stop loss and the individual stop loss? I know we went up in risk on the individual stop, stop loss to, I think, $300,000 per claim. Right. I think that hurt us last year, but I, I don't think it's going to hurt us um, this year. I do want to present <coughs> a lot of alternatives to you, you know, in, in the weeks ahead so that you can make a decision on it. You'll historically have been very interested in looking at right all those pricing differences and risk retention issues. So we hope to have a good array of options for you, you know, in the weeks ahead. Um, but for purposes of all of these projections, we're assuming the same configuration remains. Okay. So we might get to see lots of you, Steve. Well, I know you guys love to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Other than Scott. Steve, can we talk about the components of cost when you're self-insured. So obviously there are claims. We pay the claims, we pay them. Uh, Cigna oversees our, our uh, program. So I assume that there are negotiated rates with doctors and things that they work off of. So what are the components? There's a prescription component, there's a management component, and then there's a medical claim component? Well, I mean, you have, you have claim cost, which comes through your bank account as a claim. There's a lot of administrative costs built into that, not Cigna's administrative costs, but all the administrative costs associated with the medical industry, of course. But you hire Cigna to be your administrator. I mean, you, you are, in effect, an insurance company. You're hiring Cigna to administer these claims, and they have a number of different fees that they charge to do that. They have a basic administrative charge. They have fees associated with the HSA. They have a fee associated with maintaining that network and negotiating those fees, what they call a network access fee. And then the biggest component is the stop loss policy that you buy that kind of sits on top of the plan, both aggregate and individual. And we buy that from Cigna as well? You buy that from Cigna, yes. So are we, I guess what I'm getting at is, if we're looking to reduce costs, as we always are, without changing our program and putting us out of compliance with our negotiated settlement with the team, are there some things that we can look to do differently to spin off? Could we spin off that part of it? Could we buy the same stop loss <clears throat> protection from somebody else? Could we take our prescription plan, make it the same prescription plan, but take it as, are there ways to shop those things and, and look for cost savings there? Certainly all of, all of this could be bid. Um, the issue with respect to the stop loss, and we think it makes sense to do that this year, the, in the, there is a fairly robust stop loss industry that's independent of the major insurance companies. The problem is the quality of their contract typically is not as good as some of the major insurers. So, so for example, you could buy a stop loss program <clears throat> with a 20% premium reduction, and then as soon as a large claimant emerges, that individual gets lasered in a future renewal period. 
so that it's really hard to then renew that policy. Now you have to go back in a very vulnerable situation. So I would say that the, the stop loss industry, that's not an Aetna or a Cigna or an Anthem, the quality of that contract is far inferior to, to this plan. So that's a risk decision you might want to you know, think about and, and look at the, those alternatives. We've always worried about um, having a situation where you have one or two really ill individuals and now you can't get stop loss for those individuals because you, you've left this type of environment. But it's, it's a risk management cons consideration you might want to take a look at. Um, we did have the drug program separate. We did have a drug pro. You might recall that the drug program used to be with what was called Systemed, then was called Medco, and then it was called Express Scripts. When the teachers went to the HSA, there was a concern about, you know, in an HSA environment, you have this combined deductible, and so what would the logistics be in getting claims processed and on a daily feed fed into the Cigna deductible system and processed correctly? So to avoid those potential issues, the drug claims for the teacher in the teachers in the HSA was moved to Cigna. An evaluation was done on their pricing, their discounts, and their rebates, and their administrative fees, and it was fairly equivalent. And so the district decided that maybe it makes sense to move the rest of it towards Cigna and then get it all underneath the stop loss umbrella because when it was out on its own, it had no stop loss protection at all on the drug plan except for those claims that were part of the Cigna HSA plan. So moving it with Cigna was sort of a cost neutral from a pricing standpoint, but it got it underneath the stop loss. And it makes a lot of sense, I think, to have the drug plan, though you don't have to. You could pull the drug plan out even with Cigna and not have it under the stop loss. But given you know, the hepatitis C issues we're having in the industry and the cost of that drug and some of the other drugs, it might make sense to keep that under the under the stop loss. And we'll get into that when we start talking about the reserve and you'll see how the, the corridor, by doing that, your corridor expands. And that's really not an increase in your liability. It's actually, it's actually a reduction in your liability because you're taking it from a totally unprotective realm and putting it underneath the stop loss plan, but it expands the corridor. We'll, we'll kind of get into that. Some of the other things, uh, we talked last year about doing a dependent eligibility audit. That's still on, on the table. There's just a lot going on in the district in terms of changing their uh, payroll system and doing a lot with, with health care reform, that that was probably just a bridge too far to go this year. So that's something we want to, we want to do right away that um, doesn't affect the plan, doesn't affect um, any of the negotiated provisions, but to the extent we have individuals that maybe shouldn't be on the plan, that'll help, that'll help remove them. And that's almost always been a, a, a cost, certainly cost neutral, but I've never, seen, I've never seen a situation where that doesn't at least pay for itself. So that's something we want to do. But the plan could be bid, um, and the issue is not so much the fees. I mean, your fees are about $500,000. That's not an insignificant number. But does Cigna have the best negotiated arrangements and simultaneously the broadest network to keep everybody in network? That's always a question. Um, and we could, if you think it's appropriate, you know, we could bid and evaluate that. My guess is we would conclude that it probably is you know, among the best, and Cigna has a fairly dominant position in the marketplace here, private sector-wise, because, um, because of the value of those, the quality of their negotiated discounts and compared, to, compared to others. But if you think it makes sense, we could take a look at that. Are there other questions? Allison. <clears throat> I just want to say I'm really pleased to hear you say that the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that the HSA numbers are, are, are looking good, or at least it was a good decision, because I know so many of us were so concerned, because um, we've talked over the years, the fact that we've had some of the, some of the most, if not the most aggressive PPO plan for our teachers um, in New Canaan over the course of the last, you know, umpteen years. Yes. Um, I guess I want to piggyback a little bit on what Scott said, because because it's our first year in the HSA, we have no history, um, and you're only obviously um, projecting these numbers off of a couple months' worth of real hard data that we have. Um, is it type well, of well we're, in the, we're in the second year. Right? Oh, second year. I'm sorry, second mm -hmm. year of it. Thank you. Um, are, and we all know what kind of what happens in the second six months of this because of the kind of the mechanics of the plan. Um, you feel pretty confident, or should we prepare ourselves that there might be some significant play in these numbers over the second half of this year um, in terms of making adjustments for next year? Obviously, we won't have that information when we have to go ahead and, and finalize the budget, but we're always concerned about the second half of the year, obviously, versus right. the first. We only have one year of history. I mean, we, we certainly always worry about that because the last thing we want to do is give you a number that we have to go back and say, oh, you know, sorry, you have to increase it by 400,000. Oops. 
Um, so we think this is our best guess based on um, you know, everything that we've seen for the last 18 months. Could it change in an adverse way? Yes. Um, but you know, this is, you know, I think we're reasonably confident that you know, given five months of experience so far plus the year prior, that this is a pretty good shot at what next year should look like and what the rest of the year should look like. All right, thanks. But, but I didn't just jinx myself. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, Scott, uh, sorry. Stephen, is it reasonable to assume that the, the bigger we get, the more savings there are? So, for instance, if we were to somehow be able to include either the town employees or combine with Darien or just are there synergies and savings there? There's there's a few, but not not the type that a lot of a lot of folks think. Remember, you're contracting with a Cigna or an Aetna or a United that has millions of millions of people, so it is their volume that creates the clout to negotiate with the hospitals and the doctors. So taking a New Canaan Public Schools and a Darien Public Schools and putting them together doesn't really increase your market clout with whom? You know, it, you know is, is Stanford Hospital going to give you a better deal compared to the five million people that Cigna has or Aetna has or United has? So it really doesn't do anything for your claims. It could, um, with respect to administrative fees, Typically, there are, there are pricing breakpoints that might have some additional savings as you get larger. You know, the per employee administrative fee for your plan is certainly going to be higher than for a major corporation that has 20,000 employees. So as you get bigger in that sense, th that, that 500,000 administrative fee number can start to come down you know, in some ways. So um, it always makes sense to look at that. Your neighbors in New York um, have a state plan that they could participate in where the state actually becomes the insurance company so that the state treats them and some of the other coalition plans that operate in New York are actually absorbing the risk and giving them a premium to pay, although it's a self-funded plan. So that's a very different type of arrangement where they are no longer paying their own claims, even though they're in a self-funded environment. They're sharing the risk with all these other districts. And to avoid having the healthy districts leave they don't provide any information. Because if you gave everybody information, then the ones that could do better on their own would leave, and it would cause a death spiral in, in the rest of the plan. So there's very little of that in Connecticut, and, and, and to avail yourself of that really isn't there. So I think it always makes sense to look at things collaboratively, but you're not going to have a big impact on the claims. You might have an impact on the administrative fees. Other questions? Yeah, Jim. So the next exhibit, I um, just want to take a look at kind of where the reserve was, where it might be by the end of the year, and where it might be next year. So kind of walking down the FY14 year, that column on the left, you had total expenditures as, as recorded on the, town, the town's books of $12.5 million. And if you're if you keep track of this at home, that number always look, that number looks a little light, and I think it's attributable to um, in the first year of your HSA, you funded that $500,000 HSA payment in June, so that it would be available to the teachers on 7-1. So I think it got accounted for on the town's books in the prior year. So if you look at total expenditures from FY14 to FY15, you say, "Gee, what the heck happened?" So it really wasn't quite as big as it appears because that $500,000 is missing from last year and it was probably in the year before. So um, FY14, we had $12.5 million in expenditures, 2.7 in revenue, net operating costs of 9.7. Uh, the budget at the time was $9 million. We had a $734,000 intentional drawdown. Um, the town credited the reserve with a little tw about $12,000 in in interest earnings, so the net drawdown was 722. The starting reserve asset was 4.5 million minus the 722 drawdown, and so you ended that year with a little under 3.8. And so you've always wanted to make sure that that number was sufficient to fund two things: to fund the IBNR reserve, which we've talked about what that number should be. Should it be a million? Should it be a million one or two? And 
So the, the town got a letter from Cigna. Cigna identified the IBNR at about 900,000. There were some other liability issues, uh, uh, liability items in that accounting so that the total liability charged um, was, was that 1,028,000. So the stop loss corridor, which obviously you didn't need, but just by way of a metric to look at it, um, was 2.3. So you're sort of your max liability. You know, how big should that reserve be if you want it to fund the worst case claim scenario and your IBNR? So it should it needed to be 3.3 million, it was 3.7, and so good job managing that. Any questions on that? So now we kind of go into the current fiscal year, FY15. We think our total expenditures will be about 14 million, revenue of 3.16. Net cost of 10.9, as we mentioned, budget is 10 million. We're going to draw down 924. Our starting reserve should be the ending reserve from last year at 3.795. And pulling 925 out of that will end up at 2.8. Now, again, is that 2.8 sufficient to fund all the things you want it to fund? And the answer is no. Assuming the IBNR reserve stays the same at a little over a million, and your stop loss corridor now, because you know, drugs are moving into, you know, a good chunk of the drugs moved into the plan as a result of um, DHSA, the stop loss corridor was 2.8. So your kind of total worst case scenario, if you had a big claim explosion this year and had to fund the reserve, you would need 3.8. But you only had 2.87, so we'd have an issue. But you'll recall last year you negotiated with the town that new reserve facility, a memorandum of understanding, that the town will provide to the Board of Education an amount equivalent to 40% of the corridor plus the IBNR reserve. So that would be in the current year, that 2.1, that kind of pink line, 2.145. So you'll have 2.87 in reserve plus 2.145 available in that facility. So you'll have $5 million available to fund that kind of worst case scenario of 3.8. <clears throat> so now as the issue as you kind of go further you know, into you know, the, the budget year is how much, if at all, additional reserve dollars are you, do you want to draw down considering the availability of this new facility that you've negotiated with the town. So just kind of looking at it next year, total expenditures we're projecting at 14.9, the revenue we're projecting at 3.3, net operating costs of 11.6. So that's the budget that we're suggesting you need. If you budget at 11.6, meaning you don't, you don't intentionally draw down any further from the reserve, then there's going to be no further drawdown on the 2.87 that you are going to end this year with, theoretically. The corridor is going to expand a little bit, so sort of the maximum dollar amount that you want to have available to you is now around $4 million, a million or so for the IBNR reserve, $3 million for the corridor. So you'll have 2.87 in reserve. You want $4 million. There'll be 2.2 available in that pink line from the town, so once again, you'll have about $5 million available for $4 million in catastrophic expenses if, if things got really bad in 1516. Does that make sense? Questions on, questions on this paper, on this page? Yes, Penny? I guess, is it fair to say that you know, putting in 11 point, the 11.6 um, million, as uh, I think we were talking about for the proposed budget, would be the right thing to do because we're then getting on to a fiscally prudent course where we're actually budgeting for what we expect our expenses to be. Uh, as opposed to all, every year we wrestle, I mean, I know we've, we've done it with, we're drawing down the reserves. So it always feels a little bit like you're, you know, uh, on borrowed time. Well you, well, you have these two kind of incompatible directives, which is to budget for your costs in the most you know, straightforward way. We have these costs, and we want to budget for them. 
on the other hand, you want to draw down this reserve or you're being asked to draw down this reserve and you can't do both at the same time. So what's the proper balance between the two? The new, kind of the new fact is this negotiated um, availability from the town. In the past, you know, there were always comments along the line of, you know, gee, you could draw that down because the town could help you out. But this is a really much more formal, I think, doc, you know, you have a formal document there that's signed and executed by the appropriate parties. And so um, that, might, that might change how you look about, look about you know, the need for that reserve going forward. But the proper budgeting answer is yes, you should budget at 11.6, and then you know, the reserve doesn't go anywhere. That's the proper, I think, budgeting answer. But Yes. I think yes. One of the things that, uh, uh, as you uh, receive the superintendent's proposed budget, you will see the administrative recommendation of 11.6. At that point in time, it uh, gets turned over to the Board of Education, and then as you dialogue on the political side and discuss various risk factors, but from an administrative perspective, uh, we will all, uh, you know, attempt to propose to the board uh, the accurate reporting. Uh, and then the deliberations, again, among the Board of Education and then between the Board of Education and the funding bodies really can measure uh, what the appropriate risk is, especially in light of uh, the new agreement that, that was forged uh, towards the end of the budget season last year. I think that'll be helpful when we have it, all that picture together. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions now about this? Yes, Scott, sorry. Excuse me, I have a comment more than a question. We made an agreement with the town for them to uh, hold 40% of our reserve and our IBNR. <clears throat> I assume that we've not dipped into either. We certainly don't dip into our IBNR because we're continuing. So we didn't dip into our reserve as of this point because our claims are coming in under the 1.25%. If we felt comfortable a year ago, and I, we will have this discussion at great length in the future, I'm sure, but if we felt comfortable before, do we still feel comfortable with that agreement, I guess is my question. And if we did, then we have an extra million dollars in our reserve. Do we? Well, if you're asking me personally, I believe that the town in good faith uh, crafted uh, through the whole process uh, a very fair policy, okay. very fair policy. Uh, and it helped relieve the board of some significant uh, risk concerns. Okay. Good. Thank you. I guess just to confirm this, I'm reading this correctly. So you're saying that you know, in addition to you know what the costs are with 11 million, 11.6 uh, million, um, just as far as the metrics go, that we need to have at least four million to make sure we cover everything. The worst case scenario. Th that, that's a judgment, but that's the number that if you wanted to have access to a certain amount of money, four million is the right number in case things got bad, yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any more discussion? Questions? This has been very helpful. Thank you. Good to see you all. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Wait just one second. Hang on. Just so, our, cause so I know going forward, just yes. so our, because our, you know, we, you, you had, you had, you, you tantalized us with the wow. new information you're going to give us about the different um, insurance levels. So I just didn't know when we would expect that, given that we're going to be getting a first read of our budget at the first meeting in January and then a second read. So if we're going to adjust the insurance levels um, from the, I guess we're still at the 300,000 and the 20, 125%. If we were to adjust those, we would want to know that uh, kind of at our f first meeting in January, right? Mm -hmm. So that we could be considering it, have a couple of reads and uh, before we, I don't know, I'm just thinking, I just want to make sure we get the timing, but I'm happy to leave that to other people. But 
do okay. where you want to in terms of when, sure. you know, well, when I, we best I, we present. Can, I can talk with Steve a little bit. I know we're looking at mm -hmm. something the week of the 12th um, right. to talk about some capital things and some budget follow-up, and perhaps that might mm -hmm. be an opportunity to, you know, it's that tricky part that the later you go, the more accurate the information is, and you so still try and pull it right. all together, okay. of course. Um, but, you know, I'll work with Steve and, and Nancy, and we'll put something together. Okay. Sure. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you very much, Steve. Appreciate that. Very nice presentation. Moving back to our agenda, we have three consent items. Oh, excuse me, Mrs. Ha Ms. Harris. I always do. I'm so sorry. Please go ahead. It's all right. That's Lost but not forgotten. No, no. <laughs> and and <laughs> glad that you're here to participate in the last discussion, too. Um, the monthly financial report is decidedly similar to uh, the October report, except uh, if you look at the summary and note the other purchase services line, uh, which we had talked extensively about last month, that is additional tuitions booked in through the month of November. And uh, really, the rest of this statement of accounts is, again, pretty much what you saw in October as we were progressing through. Uh, again, you can, uh, that's an actual number uh, based on uh, the purchase requisitions that had been processed along with several others that were in the pipeline uh, as of the end of November that uh, I plugged into the projection. So uh, the only direction that tuition goes from this point forward is up. Uh, again, the change in uh, uh, the framework for us was that in prior years prior to last year, we had netted the excess cost uh, as the law provided as a reduction to expenditures uh, in the 13-14 year and again in the 14-15 year. The town has booked it as a revenue. However, we will begin the process of forwarding expenditures to the town looking for reimbursement. We expect the first payment of excess cost coming in, on, in February. Uh, so we will begin the process of documenting to the town and then we will expect that entire check to be turned over to the Board of Education in accordance with 1076G uh, as a reduction to expenditures. How big is the total uh, cost growth? Uh, the excess cost right now we're looking at at least $700,000. I mean, how much is the grant piece? 75%. No, that's what you're talking about, that's 700 Yes. And how much? Um, we're six and six hundred over the what we originally thought, what we originally budgeted. Well, actually, in our tuitions, we're projecting seven hundred twenty-nine thousand seven hundred eighty-seven at this point in time. So we're going to use all the seven, and then the well, and we have an opportunity. Darlene and her staff actually have another opportunity to update uh, the tuition costs. Uh, the last day in March, I believe. And uh, so the final grant that comes in, which is the very beginning of June, uh, will be modified based on whatever very expensive or highly uh, expensive uh, youngsters get placed out. Obviously, the further along in the year, the less the actual tuition for the year is. Uh, because, you know, when, when you're sending children out, in September, you're paying the full tuition. If you're sending a child out in February, you're paying half a tuition. So they tend not to meet the threshold of at least $80,000, which is our minimum requirement to absorb. So our expectation is that we shouldn't have to be taking money from somewhere else to fund this, that, that this cost overrun will come from the grant and be about a wash. It, it should be, we may have to cover some small portion of it, but we can easily document 
just the straight tuitions, but the uh, special ed transportation costs also factor in there for the very expensive youngsters. If, in fact, we were sending a child with tuition of 30000 and transportation of 30000 it doesn't factor in because it doesn't hit our required threshold. But if we had a tuition of, say, 70000 and transportation of 30000 that exceeds our threshold. And so there would be approximately $20,000 for that child that would be coming back to us. I, again, I simplified the math. Mm -hmm. It's just important to keep in mind with this that we budgeted with that excess cost grant money netted mm -hmm. out of the expected yep. cost. So mm -hmm. this is, is running close to what we anticipated. Uh, just the accounting of it at this point shows it up as a cost. So it really is the mm -hmm. only item of significance that I wanted to draw your attention to mm -hmm. uh, because, of course, uh, we will begin the dialogue, and in fact, at the audit committee meeting uh, uh, last week, uh, the auditor pointed out that the law requires that it be treated as a reduction to expenditures to the audit committee, so, mm -hmm. so that was a good thing uh, to have her be speaking uh, to recognize that that is the action that must be taken. Uh, and the CFO was there as well, who has already acknowledged and said, when you're ready, uh, start providing the documentation. So I don't believe, there is no anticipation on my part that there will be any discussion other than working through the details. Very helpful. Thank you. Do you want to, do you have anything else that you, or first any questions on that? I don't see any other questions. Do you have anything else that you want to walk us through with the statement? Huh. Are there any questions that anyone has about the uh, statement for this time? It seems that everyone does not have, no one has a question. Um, now are we ready to move to the consent agenda? Consent agenda. <coughs> Looking at the three items that are here that are three maternity leaves, and I'm sure you've had a chance to look this over. Does anyone have any questions or concerns, or do you have a motion to accept? Thank you, Allison. Is there a second? Thank you, Penny. All those in favor of accepting the consent agenda? Raise your hand. That's unanimous. Announcement about future meetings. Dr. Litsey? Sure. Uh, and we don't have another meeting until next year. Um, <laughs> January 5th, Monday, January 5th, it will be our next meeting where we will have our first read of the, the superintendent's proposed budget. Uh, we've been working hard putting these things together and as um, you know, we continue to learn more, we try to be as adaptive, as reflective as possible in putting it all together. Um, but we'll be going through and presenting the superintendent's budget. And in upcoming meetings, we're also going to be talking about our calendar uh, for 16-17 because mm -hmm. there, there's been some information around the, uh, the group that's working with the regional calendar, and so put that on the table for a first read as well. Oh. Okay. That's appreciated. Uh, we now have a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Penny. And a second. Thank you, Sangeeta. All in favor? And that's unanimous of the group that's here. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for tonight.